I don't know how many times we have been camping as a family, whether we're in a tent or whether we're in our trailer or whether we're in a cottage, uh, the same thing seems to happen. Maybe you've experienced it. We get into bed or into our sleeping bag and you're all tucked in and everything's really nice. The lights are out and it's inevitable. Within a few minutes, you hear this. Am I right? How many have experienced that? Okay, we know what that is like and we know there is one mosquito in the tent. And so what do you do? You sit there as long as you can and every time it stops... We're freaking out. It's like, right? Where is it? Uh, so what do we do? I don't know how many times I've actually got up out of bed, got a flashlight, and as soon as you're ready, it's gone. It stops. It's silent. And you wait. And your ears are tuned in like they've never been tuned in before. You're watching, you're watching, you're watching. And I'm going to do anything it takes to get that thing from flying around in the tent. Are you with me on this? We know what that's like. If that same thing was happening in our life, with an issue or with a problem, we don't go to that same extreme. Most of the time, actually, we just kind of shove it aside or put it aside and let, not let the buzzing doesn't bother us. But let me ask you, what is flying around inside your tent? With the mosquito, that thing is not roaming around free in my tent. In life, I don't think I've ever been that alert, that tuned in uh, to listening and watching for something that's wrong. Let me ask you this. Is living with bitterness better than the work to try to repair our relationship? Is living with hurt and brokenness actually better than putting the effort in or the stress or the work to restore a relationship? You know, some people will just say, uh, it's just the way I am. My dad was like that too. Or will say, I can't do anything about it. But, but all of these excuses end in nothing. There's no change and we just end up living with it. We're still angry, or we're still broken, or we're still hurting, um, we're still bitter. Folks, there are things that cannot be allowed to fly around in our tent. There are things that cannot be allowed loose in our lives. What would it take to actually get us to the point of desperation like that single mosquito? Pride, greed, envy, lust, and gluttony we've looked at over the last five weeks. These are things we cannot let fly around in our tent. Today, uh, we look at another one. Today, we look at anger. And anger is a lot like that. There is one passage of scripture among many that really help us to zero in on the problem of anger. If you have a Bible, uh, go to Ephesians chapter 4. And I have the, living, the New Living Translation that I'll be reading from this morning. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'm just going to go through one verse at a time. So I'm not going to read the whole thing yet. But I want to start at verse 26. But in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, it's a very popular passage. And it it basically says, uh, Paul starts off by saying, I beg you, live a life worthy of your calling. Live a life worthy of the gospel. Don't, Don't be tossed around and blown around by every wind of teaching. Be solid, have a foundation. And it says, uh, leave the old way, your old sinful nature and the way you used to be. That needs to end. And then he starts looking at some specific things. And the biggest one he looks at here is anger. Verse 26, uh, don't sin by letting anger control you. 
Don't sin by letting anger control you. Now, if you have a different translation there, it probably says something like, be angry, but don't sin. Or in your anger, don't sin. Isn't that interesting? Because the literal word-for-word translation here is this. Be angry, and in it, don't sin. But why does this translation, the New Living Translation, say don't sin by letting anger control you? Because that really sounds different, doesn't it? If we look at the rest of the verse, it makes perfect sense. And we remember this first verse is not two completely disconnected phrases. It is one phrase, one thought. So look at, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Now if your Bible says, uh, be angry but do not sin, don't let the sun go down in your anger, they're connected. Yes, there's lots of ways that as we express anger, it can be sin. We know that. We get that. There's ways to express anger and not sin. But there's lots of ways to express anger and sin. But that's not what it's talking about here. It's saying here that when you hold on to your anger, when you put it off till tomorrow or the next day or the next day, and let it sit there, it will control you. This is sin, it says. This is sin. It's very clear. It connects sin with with the, the holding on to the anger. So here's what I want to do. Let's put that phrase there on the bottom of the screen and let's leave it there for the rest of the morning because everything else comes back to that one thing. Okay. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Phyllis Diller, you remember the comedian Phyllis Diller? In one of her bits, she said, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Stay up and fight. (laughs) What is the Bible telling us to do here? To clear it. To clear it. Don't let your anger control you. Don't let it grab you and simmer. Here's the truth. The further anger gets from the moment, it doesn't disappear. The further anger gets from the moment, it doesn't disappear. It actually saturates who you are. It builds and it simmers and it affects all our relationships. And over time, it becomes, that's who I am. Maybe my behavior doesn't show it. Maybe I have really good filters and really good control. But be sure that anger isn't gone. Here's the lie. I told there's the truth. Here's the lie. The lie is anger fades away when you squash it. It doesn't. Jesus talks about this in Matthew. He talks about it's the heart. You ever say something and then you try to retract it? You go, where did that come from? You ever do something or lash out in anger and it's where did that come from? Jesus says it comes from your heart. Because when we squash anger, when we put it on a shelf and don't deal with it and let it go... It changes our heart. It overpowers our heart. And God's instruction here is to deal with it today. Don't put it off. And I know people who will say, well, it takes me two or three days to calm down. Then I'll deal with it. Well, folks, if it takes you two or three days to calm down, you've got an anger issue that we need to deal with. This is one of the deadly sins. Be sure that getting angry is not a decision, it's a response. But holding on to anger, letting anger sit there, is a decision. Like all of the other five sins we've looked at, anger smolders. Anger actually is like a seed that gets planted and takes root in our heart. And it changes us and it hardens our heart and slowly becomes a monster. Greed is like that. Greed pulls a sneak attack on it. And we see something, and and if, if we can deal with it immediately, it's gone. There's no root. There's no nothing. But what we do is we start thinking. And then that turns into action. We start making plans. Lust is the same thing. It jumps out at us. And, and what do we do with that thought? Do we let it stay there? How do I respond? Because the temptation, the thought isn't sin. 
but how do we deal with it? And every single week in this series so far, we've said that these are seeds, and they take root, and they slowly become normal and regular, and they take over, and then they control us to become part of our lives, and we have a monster. Here is why God says, deal with it today. Look at the next verse. Deal with it today. He said, don't let sin, don't let, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Anger gives a foothold to the devil. Two things I want to talk about here. First, the word gives. Great translation into English. We get that. We understand. Give. Uh, to supply. Uh, actually, to commit. To invite. It's a, it, it's a gift. Right? We get that. And a foothold. There's different ways you can understand a foothold. But this actual word here in the original Greek, Greek language it was written in actually means to pardon. Pardon, to cancel the debt. Sorry, I, I got ahead of myself there. That's clearly not what foothold means. <laughs> That's what forgive means. And I'll talk about that later. See, that's why I have notes here. To give or grant or supply or commit a foothold to the devil, a foothold literally means an opportunity, but the better translation is a staging area. Think about the construction that's happening here, right? The workers have an area that's cleared out that's their staging area where they're building the stuff, preparing the stuff, getting the things ready. Okay, re-look at that verse. Anger gives, supplies the devil a staging area in your life. You ever thought of it that way before? I've invited Satan in and cleared out the space so he can actually have a staging area. And what's he building? You know what? Maybe it's silent for a long time. He is building and he is constructing and you've invited him in. That's what anger does. We're granting, committing, supplying him a staging area. You see what the Bible is saying about anger? I hope that gives us a better, clearer per, uh, perspective. So it's, it's basically saying, I'm going to clean out the basement and prep it for Satan and let him have that to set up shop. Now, nobody's really saying that. But if we're holding anger for whatever reason, doesn't matter how it came in, if I'm holding it, that's exactly what the Bible says I'm doing. So go back to what we put at the bottom of the screen. Don't let sin, don't sin by letting it control you. When we let it stay, when we put it on the shelf, when we squash it, when we tuck it away, anger then is sin. Anger is an emotion. Anger is a response. That's not sin. How we deal with it and, and how we hold on to it is sin. But keeping it, holding on to it, squashing it, leaving it, putting it on a shelf, it will eventually control you. It's sin. It doesn't disappear. It doesn't lay low. It is changing you. It is changing your heart. It's hardening your heart. Satan has set up shop and building something that will show up one day, and it won't be pretty. And we gave him permission. Isn't that scary? It actually grieves God. Look at the next verse. Well, actually, verse 30. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. And I think that could be the summary verse for the whole seven deadly sins, right? We're actually, God's heart is breaking because of the way we're living and the choices we're making. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. This is what Jesus has done for you already. He's paid a pretty price. And, and, and this is what the next couple of verses continue to talk about. But before we read that, let me, let me make sure we caught up with the progression here, okay? Don't sin when you're angry. Holding on to it, 
even for a day, is sin. It invites Satan in and to set up shop in our heart, and that breaks God's heart because he's rescued you already from that. He's already set you free. He's already unlocked the door, and yet I'm choosing to sit in my cell. Does that make any sense at all? Why would we do that? Look at verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Get rid of. And it's like in the last verse, okay, here's what God has already done for you. He's already set you free. He's already unlocked the doors. He's already forgiven you, set you, set you free. But your part is get rid of this stuff. Get rid of it. You've got to let this go. Um, God is saying here already, twice in a few verses, get rid of your anger. Don't hold on to it. This actually, this whole list, bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, and all types of evil, all of those things come from a seed of anger. Bitterness comes from anger. Rage comes from anger. We, we get that. He has done his part. He's forgiven. He's cleansed. He's freed. But we're holding on to it. Jesus has unlocked the doors. He has freed you. He has delivered you. And we're still sitting in the prison? Well, you don't know what's happened to me. You don't know what that person did. Well, that doesn't change God's command to you. As a matter of fact, there's nothing in this passage about the other person. And, and if we're angry, it's always somebody else has done something, right? This passage doesn't talk at all about that person. It's all about you and, and your freedom because God wants you to be free of this. And, and when we hold it on, regardless of what someone else has done, when we hold on to it, it is messing us up. It is locking us up. This is about us and our freedom, not somebody else's sin. There is no value in, get, in, in getting paid back, in making the, evening the score, in balancing the scales. There's no value in that. There is only value in canceling the debt. There's only value. That's what verse 32 says. Instead, be kind to one another, be tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Let's stop there. There's that word, forgiving, right? Did you remember what I said before what that is? <laughs> this word here in the original Greek is actually the word pardon each other. Cancel their debt. Cancel their debt. It's not an option for us if we're a Christian. A pardon says you are guilty, but you are free from the punishment. You don't have to pay for it. You're free to go. There is no penalty. The only way to break the power of anger is to forgive, to cancel the debt. Because there is a debt that has to be canceled. Because anger is built on that. Again, but you don't know what this person did. You don't know what's happened. I can't just walk away from that. This messed up my entire childhood. Can you imagine staying angry for a whole season of your life? We've got to let this go. But you don't know what I did. There they did. I can't just walk away. I can't just give it up. We'll keep reading. 32. Instead, be kind to each other tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. If we have no other reason, it's simply because this is what Jesus did for you. And as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, there's no options here. You don't have an option to do this or to not do this. You've already been forgiven. God says, I know what they did. I know how they wrecked your life. I know how this has made you angry. I know what they did to hurt you. But during that, I pardoned you. You have a list too. And I pardoned you. It's not very often that we forgive someone because they deserve to be forgiven. 
Jesus didn't forgive us because we deserve to be forgiven. We forgive, we pardon, we cancel the debt because Jesus has done that for me. Jesus has done that for you. And God does not factor your sin into your relationship with him. He pardoned you. He gives you undeserved grace. Jesus unlocked the doors. He pardoned you. Are you going to choose to not do that for someone else? I said before, Jesus has pardoned you. He freed you. He unlocked the doors. And sometimes we choose to stay in the prison. If we get that picture really well in our head, if he has let you out and you've walked free, how dare we? Make sure someone else stays locked up because of our anger. Jesus talked about this in a parable where a man owed money and his debt was canceled, but then he went straight out to the people who owed him money and demanded that they pay and put them in jail until they could. It's exactly what Jesus was talking about. This is not an option. Set them free, just like Jesus set you free. Is it worth getting the mosquito in the tent to sleep without the incessant buzzing and the agitated swatting and the fear that when I'm asleep, I'm going to wake up with a face full of mosquito bites. So here you go. Number one, identify the truth about my anger. Identify the truth about my anger. Psalm 139 says, search me, know my heart, test my thoughts. See if there's any way in me that offends you, God. Let's admit our anger. Let's call it out. We've talked about this every single week with these sins. To understand them really well so that I can examine myself and expose them. And then find freedom in Christ. Do whatever it takes, like the mosquito, to get rid of that evil thing that's flying around in my tent. The second thing was to choose to cancel the debt. This is what Jesus did for you. And your guilt is removed from the relationship. You're pardoned, forgiven, pardoned. Cancel the debt. And I think if you're holding on to anger, you can probably think right now who you're angry about and what that's doing. What that's doing in the relationship, how that changes you and hardens your heart and what happens when you start thinking about them or you see them across the room. We know that. We'd have to choose to cancel the debt. That's a choice. That's on us. And the last thing I think is critical. We need to courageously ask for forgiveness. Because if you've been holding on to anger... This scripture says that's sin. And so you need not only to clear that up with God, you need to go to that person and ask for forgiveness for holding on to the anger. We need to clear those kind of things up. This will be hard. This is not an easy thing. But go back to the beginning of what I put there. Do not let anger grab us, hold on to us, control us. That's sin. So don't sin by holding on to it. Even past sunset. Let's take God's word seriously. One last thing. As we look through the Bible, we will see that every time God asks us to do something big, and this is something big, this is hard. Every time God asks us to do something big, he says, I will be with you. Think about Moses at at the burning bush, and he says, go and free my people. Go to Pharaoh And he says, I will be with you. Joshua, as he's mustered the army, and and God says, go to Jericho and walk around the city, I will be with you. As Jesus says to us at the end of his life, go and make disciples, I will be with you. We see this consistently all the way through scripture. Let go of your anger. Jesus says, I will be with you. Forgive, even if they're not going to come back and reciprocate or anything, even if the relationship's not repaired, it's on us to ask forgiveness. And it's on us to forgive. So, go home, go to the office, go to the phone. No matter how long it's been, let's ask for forgiveness for holding on to the anger. This is what God wants you to do. And to forgive, to let it go, to pay the debt, 
to pardon it, to cancel the debt. And guess what? Jesus says, I will be with you. Isn't it incredible to serve a God like that? He wants us to be free. And if we are holding on to anger, that is sin. And there's no question we know how that locks us up. It's actually like sitting in prison with shackles on in so many areas of our life. Satan is setting up shop. He's building something. And what's at stake? Your future. Jesus wants us to be free. We're going to sing a couple more songs. Worship team, why don't you come on up here and get ready while I pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for your example of what it means to forgive, to cancel the debt, to unlock the doors, to pardon. Thank you for what you've done for us. May we follow your example. And, and, and something like this, especially if it's gone for a long time, is so difficult to do. But God, thank you for the, the, your intention that you want us to be free, that you will be with us. God, we want freedom too from all of these things, from pride and greed and envy and lust and gluttony and anger. All of these things are seeds that, that the roots just wrap our hearts up and steal our life away. God, we want to be free. Help us to see the beauty of Jesus clearly. Find cleansing and forgiveness and freedom. In Jesus' name, amen.